Hello there, one and all, and welcome to episode 291 of Love at First Scent, with me, Persilace, coming to you, as always, live from YouTube. First comment, there is a comment, goes to Christine, who says, good evening from sunny London. Well, send a little bit of sunshine our way, because down south we have been, the, the sun has been struggling today, but mostly the clouds have been winning. But thank you very much for tuning in, Christine. Um, I always have to do a little bit of an announcement for the people who are watching live, just so that uh, they know what uh, what's ahead of us today. Two videos planned for today. Uh, the second one being a, a sort of feature length, nearly hour long one. Um, so what we're going to talk about in this first one of the two videos for today is these uh, Garland classics in their current form. And then we will take a very, very short break and we will come back with a top 10 because I did promise you a top 10 and I haven't forgotten. We are going to be doing a top 10 um, and actually one of the ideas that you gave me for a top 10. So hopefully you will be able to stick around for that one. Who else is here? Uh, Joanna is saying hello from sunny London indeed. Emma is saying good evening from Strasbourg in France. Emma is saying hello. Frag Chitown says greetings from Woodstock, Illinois. Oh, amazing. Otis says, good afternoon, everybody, and a special thanks to you, Mr. P, for another stream. You're very welcome. And another fantastic shirt. Thank you very much. I'm glad you like it. Uh, Jeff is in Chicago as well, and Prashant is saying, good evening, Monsieur Persilaise and friends, all the way from India. This video comes as a pleasant change of mood to what has been a rather boring day fighting seasonal flu. Ah, oh, sending you sending you good wishes. Anyway, keep, keep the hellos coming and the messages coming. I always read them. And even if you're not watching live, please feel free to leave a comment and ask a question. And if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, please do consider doing so. And if you would like to support my work, you will find information about how you can do that in the video description um, as well. Okay, so I said that the top 10 that's coming up in a very brief while, in a very short while, is inspired by you. This video is kind of in inspired by you as well because a lot of people have got in touch with me to say that they especially wanted me to focus on this reissued um, Garlin called Liu, not to be confused with the more modern, but I think now discontinued Louis, which I think may be out in another, under another name, but you know, that, that's Garlin for you. Um, so I thought, okay, um, let's try and make a bit of a thing of it, and let's try and get my hands on a few of these reissued classics and, and do two or three of them in a video. So here we are. What I've got for us today is you, but we've also got Naema and we've got Abrelonde. Now, Abrelonde and um, uh, Naema have not actually been out of production uh, I believe, since they were released, uh, Angel from 1906 and Naomi's from 1979. Um, oh, somebody saying hi from Dubai. That's, a, is it, I can't, I got my vision. Is it Lila or Lala? Um, but whoever, whatever your name is, you're very welcome. And please tell me roughly where in Dubai you are, because if, if, if people are watching from a town or a city that I know, I love to be able to place them. Don't worry, I will not come stalking you. Um... So, Après Londe and Nama have never been out of production, but there was a little bit of uh, a sort of a frisson of consternation uh, a short while ago, if, if I can call it that, when a lot of the classics were reissued in these uh, gendarme bottles. If you go on um, the, the Garlin website or whichever variant of the Garlin website happens to be in operation uh, where you live, you will see that it, it isn't just these three that are in these bottles now. Um, I can't even remember off the top of my head, uh, but Leur Bleu, I'm pretty certain, is in this bottle. Um, even Idil uh, has got into this bottle. I think uh, Jardin de Bagatelle is in this bottle. That was another one that I thought I'd be interested to get my hands on because I haven't smelt that one for the longest time. It would be interesting to see um, uh, how, how, how it, how, what, what condition it's in. And I think Jiki is also in this bottle as an EDP as opposed to an extra. I believe it is still available as an extra. And I would imagine that Vol de Nuit is available in this in, in this bottle as well. <clears throat> um, so a lot of people thought that as there was um, a rebottling, that there would also be a reformulation. Uh, the brand have said that there hasn't been a reformulation from the bottle that was prior to these ones, but obviously, you know, Abrelonde is not 
the same beast that it was in 1906, and neither is uh, Liu. Liu is from 1929, and Naima obviously has changed as well from 1979. But, 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 uh, oh, somebody's saying insolence is in there as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but the, 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 the forms that were available to us just before these bottlings, I thought were in pretty good shape. So the Abrelonde, uh EDT, this one is still an EDT, by the way, that was in the B bottle, I thought was in pretty good shape. Naima, as you know, I've always said that if you can get your hands on Naima Extra, that is the one to go for, but the EDP was pretty good. Liu, I was less familiar with because, of course, that was, you know, that, that was quite an old scent. Um, uh, and, and I think for a while it was available as a reissue just at the Champs-Élysées boutique. Um, but 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 now it's part of the lineup. Oh, I've got a reply from Dubai who's saying, it's Lala, I'm in the greens, I'm watching from home Onyx Tower, if you know it. No, I don't, because those areas didn't exist there when I was living in Dubai, but never mind. Um, I think I roughly know where the greens are. Okay, I think we should just smell, right? We're going to leave Liu for the end, um, although I have worn it once already. And I could not resist spraying the Abrelonde because, as you know, it is one of my absolute all-time favourites. But I haven't sprayed this Naima. And I'm a bit worried because Naima also is very, very, very dear to me, very, very precious to me. Um, incidentally, check out an interview that uh, Thierry Vassa gave me uh, a few um, a few years ago now, if you look up in the interview tab on Persilace.com, you should be able to find all of the interviews that I did with him. And he said that um, he was very, very worried about the future of Naima. Um, what are the concentrations, says Gavin? So Naima and Liu are uh, Eau de Parfum, and the Après Londe is an EDT, an Eau de Toilette. I do have to say that I think these bottles are, are very, very elegant in, in a kind of quirky way. But I do very much miss the individual bottles as well, the the the, the unique bottles. That was that was the thing that made Garlin so special, I think, um, the fact that you, you tended to get different bottles. So here we go. This is Naima from 1979, composed by Jean-Paul Garlin, of course. Um, famously a huge flop when it was released, but now widely considered to be one of the most beautiful things ever made and certainly one of the most beautiful roses ever made. Okay. Oh, well, it's totally recognisable. Oh, God, I love this stuff. I love this stuff so much. Okay, certainly the opening is, without any question, the Naima EDP that we had prior to this bottling. So if something's been changed, at least in the opening, it's been changed very, very cleverly. Um, as Adele says, I love that bottle, but agree each scent should have its own bottle. I think it's costs now. They just they just can't do it. These brands. Um, <clears throat> so, I I have talked about Nama a lot on this channel. In fact, probably what I will need to do is somewhere here, I will need to link to um to to the video that I have done just on Nama. I've written about Nama on the blog, um, and every single time I smell it, God, it is it is just something else, this scent. It really, really is one of the most hypnotic, passionate things ever poured into a bottle. And apologies, apologies for those of you who have heard me describe it in this way before. But I, I really, really cannot think of any other way of describing it because I get the same image every single time I smell it. It is this black hole, this spinning vortex of perfume, this sort of black hole hurricane of perfume, where every single facet of rose that you could possibly imagine, and maybe even some that you can't imagine, is just sort of spinning and turning in a kind of black hole perfume tornado and just inexorably pulling you in, and you absolutely cannot resist and you don't even want to resist so you've got the pepperiness you've got the honey notes you've got the milky notes you've got the powdery notes you've got the soapy note you've got the greenness you've got the earthiness you've got the clove note very 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 strong clove note actually coming across with the, so that the spiciness it 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 is just it is just one of those things that makes you think that the existence of the rose on this planet must surely be 
evidence of some kind of higher consciousness because it could not have just happened by accident. Um, ML says, please don't apologize, Mr. P. It's quite accurate imagery, actually. Yeah, I, I just it it just spins and pulls you in, you know, like a like a sort of spell, like you you'd imagine um, a, a witch or a wizard, you know, turning something in cauldron and it's spinning and bubbling around and um and yeah at least so far from what i'm smelling here it's it's it's, it's absolutely what i recognized olfactive story says funny i have the same vision as a black purple and red vortex yes thank you for mentioning colors <clears throat> because i definitely see red maybe not purple but something heading in that direction you know like like something where the reds start becoming rusty and orangey and sunsetty, it it it's just mesmerizing. Um, I feel the urge to go and spray myself with some nair. now says Marianne, do it, do it, do it, and come back. What formulation have you got? What strength have you got? Um, a lot of people don't get nair, and by by get, I don't mean in a kind of intellectual way, but it just doesn't it, it doesn't click with their soul. It it, it doesn't work. For them. I think actually my mum is one of those people. She sort of smelt it once and thought, oh okay, you know, quite strong. Not sure what's going on here. Um, but if you do get it, and if it doesn't, if it does work on you, it, it it's just one of those things that has the potential to become your signature scent, and you would never, ever, ever want to have anything uh, on your on your perfume shelf ever again. Except you would have to have like a gazillion backup bottles because the, the, this stuff is under threat. Um, according to Thierry Vassar, it contains such a high proportion of rose that. It, it is becoming more and more and more difficult to to keep selling it. That's why we no longer have Nehme Extrait, right? Extrait obviously is more concentrated, therefore there would be a higher proportion of rose in it, and that's why they they can't make it anymore. And I would imagine it's because of the eugenol content, the clove-like content of the of the rose. But I, but I could be wrong. Um, I had to have a spray of Nehme, says Nubianet. I love it, but it doesn't stick to my skin. Wear it on fabric. Wear it. So okay. That I will do my very, very best to do a blotter update on these because, of course, what we're trying to find out here is how true they are to their former selves, not their original selves, but their former selves. Um, I have got some older formulations of Nehemiah as, as well, though. Richmond says, I can get the extra, but man wants a big price. <laughs> how much is a big price? A lot of people would consider remortgaging for an MAX. I've got a few oldish bottles of the x play myself, actually, and it, it, it's ju it's just heavenly. Um, Eric says, I've said before here, worth saying again, but my mother wore Emma. She doesn't like it now, so I inherited all of her old Parfum de Toilette bottles. <sighs> mm. Okay. So like I was saying, I will definitely do a, or do my very best to do a blotter update on these because that's what we want to know with these ones, right, is, is, is how... Um, how close they are to their most recent selves. Um, would you describe Nehemiah as experimental or avant-garde, says Space Dad? Well, I think at the time it was seen as being quite avant-garde. It was it was just a bit too much. I think I think the world needed to get into the 80s before people were able to take the, the kind of big heavy hitter that Nehemiah is. It would have been absolutely fine next to the likes of Poison, but it did, it did come a little bit too soon. But, so in that sense, I suppose it's avant-garde. But I, but I, but but in another sense, it's just like, like the, the finest works of art, it's just in a category of its own. It, 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 it is just what it is. It's, it's, it's its own beast. Um, uh, Lala says, I love Nehemiah. I just bought Un Bouquet de Paris Extra just because it reminds me of Nehemiah. Oh, I don't know if I know that one. Do I? Okay, let's go to Abrelonde, which again, as you know, one of my most beloved scents of all time. So this is from 1906 by Jacques Carlin. I have sprayed this bottle before and I have worn it. And and, and again, absolutely, completely recognizable as the Abrelonde that I have worn for the last few years in the B bottle. But I just wondered, I just wondered if maybe the violet note was a bit more pushed out not 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 different so not sweeter particularly not more uh not more floral but just maybe more prominent now 
the oh Tom Tomash and Natasha have, have, have an issue. Tomash says it doesn't work on me, so it's good that you mentioned that on some people it may not work well. I'm excused. Oh, this is going back to Anama. Of course, absolutely, and, and and you just need to wear what you enjoy. Now, this is a good moment to talk about very very briefly about why some things may smell different. It isn't always just because of reformulation, as I'm sure a lot of you will be aware. In some cases, absolutely reformulation is the reason. And there are also many reasons for why brands will reformulate. And we won't get into that now. But aging um, has a, a massive effect as well. So the fact that this is, by nature of the fact that, that, that it's in this bottle, a, a fresher batch may also mean that it may smell different to me than... Uh, the bottles I've got in 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 my own stash, which even though I may have been trying to look after them to the best of my ability, keeping them away from light and heat, will just naturally start getting a little bit more oxidized and maybe overheated um, over the course of time, and and, and so they will change. Um, uh, wasn't Emma created without any actual rose in it? I faintly recollect Turian mentioning it. Yeah, that that's a that's a it's an interesting one. I mean, Garlin will say that there is rose in it, but I know that that, that that's the sort of story out there that it's 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 the most beautiful rose and it's been made without any rose. I don't know. The people at Garlin, Thierry Vasser and Delphine Jelk and, and Jean Paul Garlin, they they know the secret, right? Um so après l'onde, maybe I'm feeling the violet a little bit more because it, it's fresher. And maybe the, maybe the, the the slight predominance of the violet is pushing the iris away. Because I've always actually loved um, Après Londe as a really, really gorgeous iris scent. But I know that originally, back when it came out, it was much more about the balance between iris and violet and a kind of heliotrope almondy note. Over the years, for whatever reason, I guess maybe the iris became more prominent. So maybe now they're trying to make the violet a little bit more prominent. However, it is still Après Londe. It is still one of the most hauntingly melancholy things ever committed to a bottle. Um, it's still just breathtakingly abstract and yet somehow figurative. Of this. Because you, you, you pick out the violet, you pick out the iris, you pick out the woods, you pick out the herbs. And yet... It, it does have that abstract quality which evokes feelings and and images uh, so if we take if we if we take our sort of guidance from the name Londe, so it's after the rain shower so i suppose it's meant to be um nodding towards a, a kind of sense of optimism but it is an optimism that has come after the rain and so it's an optimism that has gone through the realities of life and has gone through the storm clouds and is trying to look towards another day but will never be able to shake off the, the painful lessons that it has learned along the way um and i and i think that's what makes it beautiful because it just manages to somehow cap it manages to capture all of those feelings somehow um this is an intro i'd like to see this comment now how can i scroll without just shaking everything nick nick says I believe there have been some advancements in violet materials in the past 10 years or so, so perhaps Garlin have been able to reformulate the scent in a way that is more akin to the 1906 original. Um, very, very possible. I don't know. We should ask, actually. Uh, Fernando says, I've been trying to find a bee bottle of Après Londe, but couldn't find one so far. Got me a bottle of Dante Bras as a fix. Well, they're quite different, though, aren't they? Quite different. Um... I think the law to restrict ingredients is absolutely ridiculous, says Oslem. Just put it on the bottle that it contains allergens and done. They destroy the art of perfume, in my opinion. I know what you mean, but I think it probably really isn't as simple as that. Uh, but, but, you know, we'll save that date for a, a debate for another day. I've not had the luck or pleasure of trying Après Londe, says Shan. I do have a decant of Vol de Nuit. How does it compare with the melancholic tone that Vol de Nuit also? Oh, very different. The opening of Vol de Nuit is completely green. I mean, very different. They really, really are very, very different perfumes. And so, please, please, please be good on the blotter and please stay familiar to all of us. To the one uh, that actually most of you wanted me to talk about. Um, this one is one that I was least familiar with. In fact, you know, Liu is not really a scent that 
was was on my radar in my frame of reference uh, growing up, or even even in the last few years. Um, I knew of it as Garlin's aldehydic floral, but that was pretty much it. Um, so, like I just said a few minutes ago, also by Jacques Garlin, who made Après Londe as well, but this one is from 1929, so yes, about eight years after the release of Chanel Number no. 5. And all of these perfumes, all of these aldehydic florals, all somehow ultimately get compared to Chanel Number no. 5. Um, be, be, yeah, because I'm, 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 and I'm sure that this was Garland's response to Number no. 5, um, think of other aldehydic florals that are out there, you know, think of uh, Givenchy's L'Interdit, you know, insert your own aldehydic floral. Um, and so, so this was Garlas. Now, in this version, and I can only comment on this version, it is beautiful. As an aldehydic floral, it's really, really gorgeously done. Um, but I think the question we need to ask ourselves with this one is, is do we need it? And is it sufficiently different from uh, number five to, to, you know, to warrant being in existence? I wore it and I, th I think the main difference that I picked out is that it seems to have, certainly when you wear it on skin, um, it seems to have a more pronounced animalic quality and it perhaps isn't, it, 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 it's perhaps just more contained and doesn't have that, doesn't have that kind of miraculous breathtaking quality that Chanel number no. five does. It doesn't have quite that sparkling quality that number no. five uh, has, even though it, it seems to tick all of the same boxes. So gorgeous, soft, powdery aldehydes at the top. Somewhere in the middle, you're kind of thinking, yeah, probably um, jasmine and rose and a musky sandal woody base. Maybe the animalic quality comes from, from the whole thing being muskier. I thought, because I know how much you like it when I do these sorts of things, I thought I would actually bring along a uh, uh, my, my EDT of, of number five, um, which th this bottle is, is, is could probably soon be counted as a vintage, um, caught because it might be interesting to do a... a a side by side comparison, even though side by side comparisons need to come with lots and lots of qualifications and caveats, because you know the minute you smell one thing, you can be um, saturating your nose, and so you may not be able to realise that the very same things may be in the next blotter that you smell because your nose is blind to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But see, it's like now I'm thinking, <laughs> am I smelling very much? But okay, and and we know as well. We need to say that the, the the various versions of number five are very different from each other. So the EDP is markedly different from the EDT, which is different from the extra. Um, but I suppose what I'm getting here from the Chanel um, is a more pronounced peachy note. Maybe it's zestier at the top, and maybe that's what makes it more sparkling. And maybe that's what gives it more of a verticality. And that's what makes me think that Liu is more contained. Liu seems to be pretty much what it is from the word go. Whereas, of course, number five takes you on a bit more of a journey, I think. Um, yeah, it, interesting. And, and it'll be interesting comparing them side by side as they as they develop. Because uh, I was asking myself, okay, why does this, why does the Garlin not seem to have quite that same chic, buttoned up, immaculate sophistication that 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 number five has, even though on the face of it they're they're similar sorts of things. Um oh, and Rachel saying the Lila Noor Rose and other perfumes are beautiful. Ah, oh, so you got your discovery set. They're not bad, are they? I told you, they're not bad. Yeah, the, 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 the number five, the Chanel, has got more contrast. Maybe it's got, maybe that maybe the tart fruit is actually what's making it more interesting. Okay. However, blotter update coming along at some stage, probably tomorrow. I think we can say that on the strength of these three, the classics are in pretty good shape. And 
we will end by saying that that is certainly what a lot of you out there feel and what a lot of you have wanted to, uh, you know, have gone out of your way to write to me to say that even though things have had to change, um, a lot of the time through no fault of Garlin's, the people there, uh, Thierry Vasser, Delphine Jelk and the whole team really are working very, very, very hard to keep these as close to um, the state in which we need them to be as possible. And, and and certainly these three, you know, I would I would absolutely recommend. I mean, they're they're gorgeous. The the Lou is probably um the least vital, the least necessary, but uh, I think it's great that um Garlin have an aldehydic floral as well. So thank you very, very much for watching. And if you are sticking around for the lives, then we will be back in just a few minutes with a top 10. So see you in a bit. Bye.